Industries, and this is Miss Dolly Rusher. Uh, we're going to do our first unpacked interview. Um, my first time doing this, so it's <laughs> probably not going to be very professional. We got this. That's God's right. got this. But we're just going to follow the lead of the Lord, and we're going to listen to Miss Dolly's story. Um, she recovers out loud. And, uh, you made me cry already. <laughs> I took her overcomer pictures probably, gosh, what was it, last fall? Yeah, last fall. And um, she pushed me outside my box <laughs> when it comes to taking pictures, and I loved every minute of it. And she has become special to me ever since then, like a, like a <laughs> sister. So we're going to wing this. Um, we're just going to let the Lord lead. I hope you enjoy it. Um, so I'm going to start out with my first question. All righty, here we go. What was the first memory that you can remember from your childhood? Okay. So uh, my first real memory that I can remember is, uh, I remember my grandfather lived in this rock house, this big, beautiful rock house. I love a rock house to this day. You know, the big boulder, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. And uh, I was probably two or three, I can't remember. But I have a memory of walking into my grandpa's living room and my dad was there and I don't know where my mom was, but my dad was talking to my grandpa and they started getting angry because my little shorts were crooked. Really? And I had just come out of my, my half brother's bedroom and I remember I wanted to uh, put in this 8-track, in his 8-track player of um, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, and I wanted to play it. And uh, that was the price I had to pay. I I'm assuming now as an adult to, you know, get to put that 8-track in to hear the song. And I don't remember everything that happened in there, but I remember my dad being so mad and telling my brother he would kill him if it ever happened again. And I remember that. And that proceeded through my childhood until I was about 10. Your brother molested me. Yeah. Your half-brother? My half-brother. Yeah, and when I was about 10, I pretty much, you know, I'd had so much of it, I was like, I'm going to tell Dad, and he quit doing it. And I'm guessing maybe because I got older, you know, but it happened for that long, off and on. So was he your dad's son? My dad's son okay. with and a previous wife. lived with you all yeah. the time? Yeah, 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 up until I was about 16 when he went back to live with his mom. So, like when this was happening, when you were younger, what what was going through your mind? Like you knew you knew something. Survival wasn't right. mode. Survival mode, and not only that, you know, I had to deal with my dad beat my mom so bad all the time. She wasn't allowed to wear makeup. She wasn't allowed to have friends. She was if she, if if she was made to get a job because we needed it. She would get beat when she came home and accused of cheating. So it was like a no-win situation. You know, my whole my whole childhood was survival mode. And uh, did um, were you were you scared to tell your dad? Oh yeah, yeah. I was scared to tell my dad. I was scared to, you know, what do you do? What do you do? I'm dealing with, you know, my, my, my home situation. It was not good. It was not good. I'm not saying my, my parents loved me. My, my dad was my best friend and, and my enemy too. When he, when he passed away, I was so sad but so relieved because the day he died, I was fighting with him over my mom. And then he took a, a handful of pills and calmed back down and his heart gave out, you know, wow. because I, I wouldn't let him hit my mom. And so that was my whole childhood when I got big enough. Well, my half sister, so my half sister owned, you know, Brad was her full sibling. But she told me as an adult that 
she remembered when I was about two or three. Your, your half sisters telling yeah. you this? Yeah, when I was about two or three, um, mom and dad were fighting, you know, so bad, and he was pistol whooping her with a 357, and I tried to get in the middle of it, and he took me and he slung me across the room and into a wall. So even back then, I was trying to break it up, and that was my life. You know, that was my whole childhood. Every time he would drink or he would get high, you know, throughout the years, mom would pay. And I would always get in the middle of it and always take it because I didn't want to hit my mom. So alcohol and drugs was a part of your home? Yeah. Just yeah, your dad? Absolutely. Just yeah, just my dad. My mom didn't even drink. She didn't. She would smoke cigarettes, but she wouldn't drink. She wouldn't take a Tylenol. She wouldn't do anything. Just my dad. Yeah. Yeah. So, when you told your dad, I did you tell your dad? I was married. When you told your dad? I was married. Really? I, I was married. I, um, I, it didn't come out until I was 17 years old. I had my daughter. She was a baby, and my half sister had come up to visit with her her daughters, and um, I finally got up the courage and told them because she had her daughters around him. And she he went back to live with his mother at this point, and um, we lived in Farmington, Missouri. I remember oh. the house. I remember you know, and I finally got up the courage to come out with it, and she did not believe me. No, my dad did because, yeah. you know, he kind of knew all that time, you know, he had an inkling and a feeling from when I was little mm -hmm. and that happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's always been, you know. So he just decided that, or you think he just decided that you were just too old now and so he just left you alone? I, I have no idea, but I remember um, exactly where we lived when it stopped. We lived... Um, in a little town outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. And my mom and dad were running two chicken houses and we lived in a trailer and I was about third grade. I even remember the shirts I had for school. Ain't that crazy? Really? Like I remember this one shirt I had for school, but that's that's when it stopped. I had had enough, yeah. you know, I'd had enough. Do you ever remember telling him that? Yeah, but yeah. I remember the day I told him I was done. I'll tell daddy and he'll kill, he'll he kill you. <laughs> did he ever threaten you? Your, no. your half brother? No. He never threatened you? No. Um, no. Okay. As you say that, I don't, like I have no recollection of him ever threatening me physically at all. And little bits and pieces come back to me when you say that. I don't know if he ever told me that he would tell dad or I'd be in trouble or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. So I don't want to say one way or another because I'm not sure, but I have these little bits and pieces and some things are, some things are really vivid. Like I all remember, you know, where we lived and what was happening and, and all this. But then like you said that, like, I don't, I can't remember if, you know, there was a time where he was ever like, you know, I'll tell dad and you'll be in trouble or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I remember that I never wanted my mom and dad to be away from me because it would happen, you right. know. And at one point when I was probably in first or second grade, my dad got in trouble. Um, he had beat some guy, surprisingly, because the guy hit his wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> How ironic, Yeah. you know. And then somehow he brought the woman home to our house to save her. She was pregnant. And my mom wound up getting in trouble, too because the woman went back to the guy and said they kidnapped her. And anyway, mom and dad both wound up locked up oh, yeah. for about a week before the, I think they made bond or something. I was young, you know, at that so time I did. I was, my grandma lived with us, okay. but that was no help to me yeah. because, you know, it would happen. Or I'd always, I remember wanting to like play a game, like, will you play checkers with me? Will you, you know, and I had to pay the price yeah. for that to happen. Yeah. Okay, so let's, um, so I just want to let everybody know Dolly has a daughter. Yep. And she has a. And I have a, two, two sons. Two sons. One of them's yeah. running around no, here two, somewhere. two older sons. Oh, you do? 
Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. Yeah, they got adopted out. Okay. Through. Yeah. Okay. And she's got a another little one a running little around one. here. Yeah. And she's got another one that we've got to we're gonna get into that later. Yeah. Um. So let's move into let's go middle school years. So here's the thing. So Melissa, from the time my mom and dad caught that charge, you know that my dad decided to run. So maybe second grade, I had went to school at all this point up into in Gurdon Elementary School in Arkansas, you know, from kindergarten to second grade. That was my home. It was my familiarity. And then he decided he's not going to jail. So we packed everything that we could in a car van, I can't remember, I think it was a car of 88 Delta. Wow. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> and um, that's all we were allowed to take. So from that point on, my school was not, I probably went to school maybe three times after that through the years. That's it. Really? That's it. And that was when he felt like he wouldn't be caught. I wasn't allowed really, um, like when we would move somewhere and, uh, you know, I would beg, let me go get a library card because I love to read. And he would maybe feel like that's going to get him caught, you know, or me going to school is going to get him caught because they're going to track the records. So I probably went, I went to third grade after that in Mississippi. And then after we, we moved from there, I, because I would raise all kinds of cane wanting to go to school. And then again, I think I touched down somewhere in sixth grade. So they would have to test me. They grade? would have to test me when my mom went to put me in school. They'd have to test me to see where I'm at. So I always was a gift and gifted and talented growing up. Yeah. I was always very smart. Never, you know. And so I would always be on the same grade level, basically, as what my age as yeah. I was supposed to be. But I think from third grade, and then I, I was allowed to go to school. I think it was fifth or sixth. And then after that, I went to school one. Okay, so we had to take a little break, and we're back. Where did we... Okay, Dolly went to ninth School. grade. Yeah. Ninth grade. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so let's go... Your teenage years. Like... So oh, my I, teenage years, ironically, I never did drugs. I was always um, stayed reading. I always had my nose in a book. Can you picture that? Yeah, <laughs> I, I still, can. if I had time, I would read. I've always been. I love to read. And um, so I never even smoked a joint till after I was married. I never, I did drink. My, my parents would let me drink and I would drink at home, you know, but I never did anything else. Yeah, ever. Mm -hmm. And I could have. You so know, when, I could have. When? Like, I was prescribed uh, pain meds growing up because of all my joints. At 17, I was on morphine and Oxycontin. But I never would take them because I didn't want to feel. I tried taking them one time and they made me throw up because it was just too much. So my dad would take my script and sell it. Oh, okay. You know, so, yeah. yeah. So when... When was, when's the first time you got into, when did you start doing drugs? When did you? So I was married, I was married, and this didn't have anything to do, you know, I had started smoking pot, and somehow my, my ex-husband, he was my husband then, um, we were hanging out with some people, and we both wound up in trouble, they had a checkbook, I wrote them, and I wound up with seven counts of forgery, he wound up. Uh, in trouble too and from that point moving forward the next few years we never we got separate well he got bonded out I bonded out we got on put on probation uh, we lived in Farmington Missouri my daughter was probably about eight nine months old maybe a year at that point I so can't remember you, you two had this had a daughter together yes okay. my daughter Ashley and where did you all meet when I was in by Burnham yeah okay. I think I got pregnant so when we met town. and then we okay. tried thought we were going to make a little family it's going to be okay you mm -hmm. know and we wound up living with my parents and um anyway we both wound up in trouble and got put on probation and i'm like okay well you know i can want this too you know yeah. well my dad you know was selling pills still 
you know, I'm talking about five gallon, five gallon buckets full. And he wound up selling to somebody that got pulled over leaving our house. Well, that wound up, that wound up into, oh no, he's gonna tell, let's sleep. So again, oh. we loaded everything up in a vehicle and a trailer that we could and we left. So my whole childhood, all I ever knew was don't get close, close to anything because you're gonna have to leave it, you know, my whole childhood. So again, here's the position we're in as everything loaded up and left. So we went back to uh, Mississippi and, uh, you know, got grounded down there. My daughter was, you know, almost two probably at this point. Me and, me and my ex-husband are on the run because, of course, we left our probation mm -hmm. because Dad didn't want to hang around. Right. So now I'm on the run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I'm on the run. So... We get down there, we have this house, and um, I didn't want my parents taking care of my daughter. I could not get a job because I'm on the run at this point because my dad didn't want to stick around. You know, yeah. so I'm in this position. What do you do? How do you make money? So I started doing the one thing that I saw my dad do. Started selling drugs. I learned how to cook crack, cut crack, you know, weigh cocaine. I went to this guy and, and told him, okay, look, I need to make some money. I need to take care of my daughter. And he was like, not unless your dad says it's okay. Why? Why your dad has to say it's okay? Was he dealing with yeah. your dad? Yeah. Okay. So my dad and him, you know, we sat down in the kitchen and they showed me how to do it. And from that point forward, I was selling coke and crack. You were selling or doing it? No, I was selling, selling it. I had started about a month, two months in. Uh, you know, my dad was one of my best customers. Really? Yeah. And I remember he would run his bill up and I would, you know, because I knew mom, you know. And then I started doing it with him. You know, the coke and, um, you know, here and there. Not... Not all the time, here and there, a little something. And uh, we wound up at a roadblock, me and my husband at the time, okay? And I jumped out and went and knocked on these people's door and stuffed all the dope and walked back out. And they said, did you know that he's wanted in Missouri? And I said, no, I didn't know that. You know, anyway, I don't know how, but I got released. They didn't oh. run. They ran my name in Mississippi, but not Missouri somehow, uh -huh. or I'd have been gone. Well, it wasn't maybe six months after that I was gone too. When he got uh, arrested and sent back to Missouri, that was pretty much the end of our relationship. A couple years later, we we were divorced. Maybe a year later, we were divorced, um, and then uh, that started the stint of my prison. You know, I wound up. It was a repeat cycle. I wound up getting caught for the Missouri charge, uh, going back and forth to court, and then finally they sent me down for a 120. Okay. Yeah. What's a 120? Uh, four month of 120 shock. This was, I was 20 years old. You know, I was a baby mm -hmm. going in, and I was, I, 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 I went in to r and and they do all the medical and da, 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 and they found out I was two months pregnant. And so there I was in prison for the first time pregnant. You know, and I remember writing my dad and begging him not to disown me because the baby was mixed. Oh, really? I remember. And and my mom wrote me, her dad, you know, and he told me he not, I was always going to be his baby girl. No matter what my dad did to my mom, I, I didn't find out until years later he had porphyria. It's an enzyme disorder, so if you drink... It's a, it's something to do with your liver where it makes you trip out and go violent. So all the things he was doing did not help the situation. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. he, he lost control. But he was always, my, he taught me how to fish, how to hunt, you know, how to fight. Because yeah. <laughs> I would fight him, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, there I was pregnant in prison for the first time. Got out. I was six months pregnant. You know, straightened my little life up, had a, had a job, got grounded, had my son. 
and um, wound up, his dad put his hands on me. Tyrone was two months old, and his dad put his hands on me, and I called the cops. And they wound up locking us both up, and I got sent back to prison, and my baby got taken. Oh. And while I was in prison, my mom fought, 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 and got him. And so when I got out, she had my son. It was just a repeat cycle for the next few years uh -huh. of doing good prison. I would get violated on certain things and sent back to prison. You know, so that was the next. Uh, my twenties were basically in and out of prison. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you're let's let's get into Jensen. What's your son? Jay Sean. Jay Sean. Let's let's talk about Jay Sean. Um, and Dolly had a sweet. So little... before that, though, I had okay. I had Joseph. All right. Oh, okay. And, and Joseph. So I have two okay. sons, Tyrone and Joseph. Um, per me going in and out of prison, in and out of prison. Uh, the last time I got sent from Mississippi to prison, they locked my mom up. They took my kids. My daughter got sent back to her father, and they adopted my sons out while I was in prison through foster care. So. Do you have any contact with them today? So my boys have failed me, and sporadically, yeah. They're going through their own, you know, I pray, 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 because I know that God will work it out. You know, I just keep trying, and he'll yeah, work it out. You know where they are? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. My, my, I have one son at Ole Miss, and my other son lives right below Memphis in South Haven, and then my daughter, you know, where... It's a slow process, you yeah. know, we, we talk here and there, and that's all that I can ask for because right. I put myself, you know, I made those decisions and I put drugs before my kids. It, it takes baby steps. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. You had a lot of working out to do, and they have a lot of working out to do. And yeah. Yeah. Little baby steps. Yeah, God's got this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a pine needle in my eye. Yeah. <laughs> you sure think these eyelashes? eyelashes. <laughs> Glad I got the pawn <laughs> stick. <laughs> okay, so what's what was the next step after? Oh, so I wound up. Well, when they got adopted out, I wound up uh, getting back out of prison, and I decided I was going to stay up in Missouri. I didn't want to do. I didn't want to go back. They weren't there. My mom was still there alone. I didn't want to go back and do the same things again. You know, mm -hmm. so I was like, I'm going to break the cycle. You know, and I stayed up here and uh, wound up moving to Fairview Heights, um, Illinois, and starting over. And I got pregnant with Jay Sean Maximilian. I love that name. And um, was doing good, you know. And my mom decided she's going to move up here to be with me because there was nothing down there in Mississippi holding her. You know, my dad had passed away, there was nothing. And so she came up here to live with me. I had a little house and there we were. And I met a man named John. And um, he wasn't a gangbanger. He wasn't a, a, you know, he had a he had the same job for four years. He was stable, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. he was stable. And um, we started a relationship, you know, he came from a good family. I, you know, and I was so like, how did you meet? Um, just in town, just in town. I would always, uh, when I would be, uh, you know, in traffic going here or there, I would see him going to work at certain points and just started talking, you know, and build, you know, building a friendship and then it became a relationship and, uh, I wound up getting a bigger house because it was me and my mom now and, and Jay Sean. So I got this bigger house God bless me with. And I'm like, man, things are, you know, things are, are looking up yeah. for me. I'm not doing anything. You know, I'm not selling any cocaine. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, John moved in with me, my mom, and Jay Sean. Okay. All right. So we were just regular living, you know, living our lives. And my mom began volunteering at this free store. They had a free store the church ran where people could come and get what they needed. 
And so it gave her something to do. After all these years, she was able to get out and kind of do what she was finding herself. Mm -hmm. But my whole life, my mom fought cancer. Oh. My whole life, from the time I was born, she had it before I was born, breast cancer. And so through the years of me growing up, she had a radical mastectomy uh, implant put back on. Um, It would go on remission, it would come back out, it would go on remission, it would come back out. All this time, she never took a pain pill. My dad was selling them all. Oh, yeah. You know, she she just wouldn't touch them, no matter how much pain she she was in. she just stuck with him? Like, she just stayed? And all this time, I was popping pain pills as an adult, too, when I got, you know, you know, I'm talking probably 8, 10, Lorset, 10, 650s at a time and eating them like they were candy all at once. Mm -hmm. And it would last maybe two hours, and I'd eat another handful. You know, yeah. And so, so, but your mom just stayed with your dad through all. Of she the was so loyal to him. No, yeah. yeah. And I grew up. You know, the the ironic thing is, I grew up fighting and 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 vowing I would never become my mother. And through it all, slowly I became my father. Fighting not to become my mom. Controlling. No man will ever tell me what to do. But I became him. That's exactly how he was. Isn't that crazy? It's weird how that works out. You know? Yeah. 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 And I became him. So now God's still showing me things I have. Every day he shows me something I need to work on. I think it's you that know? way till the day we die. Yeah. You yeah, know? but I, I thought how ironic. I became my father. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And at one point, my half-sister, she told me, I can't even look in your eyes, Dolly, because your eyes are evil, just like Daddy. How'd that make you feel? I mean, they probably were. But, I mean, how did that make you feel? Did it even phase you no. at that time? No, it didn't, it didn't phase me, you know, because I was still, you know. At the time she told me that, it was a time after everything happened, and you could not even, you I had so much up. hate in me, I would just shoot you in a moment. I didn't care, you know. Yeah. But going back to John, um, I had decided I was going to go back to school, and I was going to make something of myself, you know. And uh, we had, we never fought, we never argued. You know, my mom would go and volunteer at the free store every day. And, you know, it was just living life. And a week before I was supposed to start school, we got into a fight. Not a fight, not a physical fight, an argument. And you know how people say things that they don't mean when they're arguing, you know. And he told me. I will make your life hell for the rest of your life. And what was the fight about? I don't even remember. It was something, you know, and it was just verbal. And you don't really, when you're fighting, you don't think, you know. You just think you're fighting and then the next day. You're saying things and, uh, you know, you're just trying to hurt each other. Right. You know, and I thought, you know. And uh, a week later, it was a Monday. I was, I got, we were getting ready. Everything was great you know Uh, my mom was getting ready to go volunteer I was getting ready for my first day going to Vaterot to you know cosmetology and I had to catch a couple buses to get there (coughs) and um, we had it worked out because he worked nights he was going to watch Jay Sean while I was in school I'd be back home at school and my mom would be back from the free store in time for him to you know because he would get off at like two or three so he would have about six hours sleep and then, you know, we had it all worked yeah. out. And um, I was getting ready. It was a great morning. Um, you know, we were listening to music, getting ready, and they got ready to walk me to the bus stop. So Jay Sean was in his stroller. And now, how old was he at this point? 21 months old. Okay. He was 21 months old. And um, he was in his little dinosaur jammies, you know. <laughs> And we stopped at this little store so I could get him breakfast. And, you know, I got him a burrito and I got him a juicy juice, a bug juice and a something, something else. And um, I'll tell you in a minute about that burrito. But uh, waited on the bus and I got on the bus and I remember waving to him, you know, and the last thing I said to him was, Mama loves you, we'll watch a movie when I get home. And I got on the bus and walked to my seat waving and that was the last time I seen him. You 
since the last time I seen him alive. He pushed him home and he beat him to death. So, and the burrito was still in the, in the freezer. He never got to eat his burrito. And there's no... So, why do you... Okay. That day, at uh, my first, uh, at lunch break at school, I was trying to call to check on Jay Sean and talk to him, and I didn't get no answer. I didn't get no answer, and I called my mom, and I'm like, I'm, you know, John's not answering the phone. Will you go check and make sure everything's okay? Because I'm two cities away. This is in Granite City, and I'm in Fairview Heights at school. And when I was going on my lunch break, I called her, you know, and I was walking back into class, and she called me, and her words were that M effort killed bug. She had walked in, and he threw my son at her dead with a scream stuck on her. Face. With a what? With a scream stuck on his face. I... Did he have, I mean, why? I don't understand that at all. At the trial. Don't ever, ever, ever put your hands on a child like that or at the trial, Take the, anything out on a child. The prosecutors told me at the end of the trial because I wasn't allowed in there. So for four years after this happened, I he wasn't allowed in there at all. My mom, no. So for four years, I begged my mom to tell me the events that happened when she came home, and she refused. She passed away 11 months after my son was murdered from the cancer she gave up. And I begged her and begged her the whole time, please tell me, I need to hear it so I can process it. I need, you know, and she wanted to die in the house where my son died. That was her, so I bought the house. And uh, I didn't want to be in the house after the few, you know. I wasn't allowed to see him at the hospital because the school administrator took me home that minute. and. When I got there, I remember Major Jeff Connors walked up to me and told me he was dead. And so then they, they and then they rushed me to the back of the the yard and into a vehicle because the news were circling, and um, they took me to the hospital. And I'm sitting in there, and they wouldn't let me see him. And then you know from there I'm trying At to. At this time he was already gone. Though. He was gone when my mom came home. But this is the events they took me through, you know, mm -hmm. and and then during the the funeral, at this I'm, everything's hazy to me, you know. Like I I'm in shock. Like I still can't believe like nothing. I can't believe that you know like this and is even uh, real. Yeah. This, this like be real. why how you yeah. know? And I remember a week before it happened. We had just mowed the grass and the windows was up and the fresh air was coming in and, and, and Buggy was asleep and Nancy Grace came on and it was the Kaylee Anthony story. And I remember thinking, man, I don't know what would happen if that ever happened to me. And a week later it happened to me and I wasn't just, you know, and I, I wasn't allowed to see him at the funeral home. Finally, after begging, 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 can I see him? They let me see him right before they closed the casket to go to the, and I will forever have that, that picture in my head. I can't even look up, a, I can't look at this certain picture of him when he was born wrapped in a blanket because it reminds me of how he looked wrapped in the coffin. Yeah. You know? I, I can't imagine I would ever be able to. And I lost it. I lost it, and I begged my mom for 11 months, you know, all the rest of her life. And I didn't want to be in the house because the, there was holes in the ceiling from weapons. And there I was having to take care of her because she refused hospice. And trying not, I didn't know any, pro, you know, no steps to grieve. I didn't have no, what do you do? How do you get through that? How do you do it? You know, I didn't know, and then I had to take care of my mom, too, so everything just kind of got pushed aside. Pushed down. And 
And, and, and yeah, and when she died, I remember, you know, the day she died, I called the doctor and they told me, Dolly, she's, she's you know, probably going to go. You need to make sure she's okay and walk away for a couple hours and come back. And, you know, they walk me through what to do with somebody dying. And uh, after she'd taken her last breath, I remember when the, you know, the cops came to pronounce her. I'm losing it. Oh, yep. The uh, cops come in and me telling them I'm all alone now. I'm all alone. I don't have any family left. So how long from Buggy to your mom was 11 it? 11 months. My son got killed September 10th, 2012. My mom passed away in August of the following year. So you didn't have time to grieve or anything? No. And from that point forward, I lost. I lost it. I didn't care anymore. I didn't have anything to live for. I felt I didn't have any steps. What do you do from that point going forward? I lost it. And four years later, the trial happened. And I thought for the four years, I thought, okay, so I'm finally gonna be able to hear what happened to my son so I can process this. Agreed. So, you know, I felt like I needed to hear it so I could process it. And then the trial came and they wouldn't let me in there. I had to stay in a motel room and get updated every day. You know, they, they took care of me, put me up. I was allowed to hear the verdict get read. So I wasn't allowed in there to hear the trial. I wasn't allowed to be in there at all. So every day they would call me and update me about court. Okay, so why why was there a reason you couldn't be It's there? a state law. Oh, really? Really? It's a state law in Illinois that you can't hear testimony or some, some it's some kind of law. And um, so, I, and I think a lot of it is that I didn't, uh, one of the jurors fainted during the trial when they showed the pictures of my son. One of the jurors fainted and a doctor that was testifying got up to run over there to help. And then his lawyer's trying to get a, a mistrial because of it, because the, the, the they got up to, it was a big, but I wasn't allowed in there. And I think a lot of it is they didn't want me to hear how bad it was. He had over 50, he had over 50 wounds from being hit in the head and all down his body. So I think a lot of it is they were trying to save me. I, my, I mean, I just can't fathom why anybody would ever think of doing something like that at all. And then after the, after the verdict got read and I was in the bottom of the courthouse. They gave me a video of my mom testifying because my mom's video testimony before she died is what? Friday. Yeah. Um, so they gave me a copy of it and I never could. I tried to listen to it. I'd get two minutes in and I couldn't. So I threw it away. Do you ever regret that? No. Because I. And after that, uh, after that, it was uh, Katie bar the door. Hell have no fury. I was didn't care. I stayed high. I stayed high. You know, I didn't want to feel. Yeah. So how long were you running like that? About five years. About five years of self destruction. Um, I, you know, caught a couple of burglary cases or possessions. I wound up with two counts of distribution methamphetamine at Arala, and then my door got kicked in in Joplin, and I got caught with nine grams of heroin and scales and everything else that goes with it, you know. Yeah. And um, I wound up in Phelps County Jail, and... Um, Obviously, you know, I've been there a while, you know, so drugs were coming, you know, from the weekenders, they would bring things in, and I wound up uh, overdosing in the back of the jail, you know, and I just had enough, you know. 
uh, a good friend of mine brought me back. Uh, the jailers never knew, but they somehow they brought me back. I don't know how I was gone. I woke up soaking wet and soaking wet in the shower. You know, uh, by the grace of God, God, that's what it was. It wasn't that shower, buddy. It was God. It wasn't my time. So, were you exposed to like church or religion or anything growing up? Or yeah, you know, yeah. I my grandpa and my grandma went to a Pentecostal church, and so I would go to church. It was called Happy Hollow. My uncle was the preacher. And while my grandma and grandpa, while my grandpa was alive, we went to church every Sunday, Wednesday, every revival. Yeah, and I loved it. But then when my grandpa died and it was just my dad, was I remember your... sporadically going to church. Like before we went on the run the first time, I would go to church with friends. And that was your dad's dad? Yeah. Yeah, and I would go to church with friends here or there. So but... your dad was probably raised in church? Hmm, I don't know. I doubt it. I don't know. I can't say that. I don't know. But, you know, I don't know. Okay, so you were brought back after yeah. an overdose. I was brought back. Um, the day I pulled chains, now what's that the day mean? I pulled chains, the day I went to prison okay. on all those charges, I knew I was never, I was done. I was done. With? Everything. I was never going to get high again. I was done. And through the years of me using, um, and it was an endless cycle, you know, losing my kids, let me go use more drugs to not, to not feel. This happened, let me not feel, you know, uh, because I knew no other way to deal with it except to put my big girl panties on and just keep on trying to get through each and every day and survive. Survival mode, survival mode. And I knew I've that was the last time I knew I was done. When I went to prison, I was never going to touch it again. And throughout all the years of me using, I always knew um, when I'd be done, I was done. And so when people would ask me when I go to get out of prison, because I've been five times, you know, and when people would ask me, well, Dolly, are you going to know? You know, I would hit the ground and be like, you know, parole, catch me. I'm done. I'm not coming to see you, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so it was a repeat cycle. You know, you have to catch me. So this time I knew I was done, I was done. I've never been to a treatment, I've never, you know. A year into my sentence, about a year, year and a half into my sentence, I was praying about where to go. And God gave me Becca's number. I don't even remember how I got Becca's number from One More 24. But I was praying on what do I do, where do I go, where do I home plan to, I have no family. I knew I was going to be different though, but I'm like, what do I do? So I knew I had to take the steps to build up my community support because I have no family. I've got to have a support system. So I wound up with Becca's number and I called her and, you know, she had a bed for me. I had a year to go on my sentence and um, I had to come up with how to pay the fees, you know? So I had a friend of mine. And he paid her off little by little and paid my, my program fees and got me in and I home planned to one more 24 and never looked back. And so when you were there, is that when you, I mean, I know you knew. I still had more grieving to do. Yes. I still had, I needed a place to heal, to grieve. I had been healing and grieving in prison, but I still needed to heal and grieve more. I'm still, you know, working through stuff, working through, you know, with, with Jericho, you know, like like trusting somebody to watch him. Yeah. You know, God's still taking me through things I'm growing and working through trauma and working through grief on because... And how old is Jerry, Jericho? Jericho's one and a half. One and a half, and he is a cute little He's thing. my biggest blessing. Yes. Yes. He, I, he's a cute thing. I came, you know, I came to One More 24 and... Uh, started building up my community support and I managed it for I think nine months of the year I was there. I was a house manager and graduated. Um, three, two months later I had Jericho and I named him Jericho Jeremiah, Jeremiah after Box, mm -hmm. after, after Box because he's a great man of God. Mm -hmm. And Jericho after the walls of Jericho come crumbling down. And um, so he's Jericho Jeremiah Mathon Rusher. 
and uh, he is my miracle baby. He is my my biggest blessing because I thought I would never have any more. And when I had Jay Sean, they told me don't because it could kill me because of my own health problems, my heart. And God said, watch this. And so what, what are your health issues? So I have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a connective tissue disorder that affects my heart. And it causes aortic aneurysm dissection to where, um, some kind of where you, you could get blood clots, your heart could explode basically is a simple way of saying dissection. Um, so it destroys the tissue. My my joints are very lax. If you pull on my legs, you'll feel it. It feels like they dislocate, mm -hmm. and that's what I tell the doctor. But he's like, it's just the elasticity. It's just the way they stretch because the tissue's gone. And then, so they're, the discs are laying on top of each other because of it, and it's an inherited disease. And um, I have osteoarthritis from the waist down, and every joint it's attacked. And this girl just keeps going and going. And Sober. Going. Sober. <laughs> she's got a car. She's got two a cars. She's got a two baby. cars. God gave me two cars. You hear me? Paid off. <laughs> yeah. Paid off, and are not with drug money. Yes. <laughs> with right. hard earned money. Right. <laughs> this. She just gives me inspiration. Um, you've just been through a lot, and. You've come out on the other side, and you've put in the hard work, God. and you're real as can be. God, hard work yes. in Jesus. You know, I started growing my relationship with God back in prison, because I always knew there was a God, and I remember thinking when my grandpa died, I remember coming home from the funeral, I was about six, and I remember promising him, because I was always a good student, and I remember promising maybe his spirit, he was, he was already gone, but that I was going to make something of myself and I was going to break the cycle. I knew there was a cycle even back then at the age of six and I was going to be the one that was going to stop it. And I took the long way to do it and I remember promising him I was going to graduate. Well, I didn't get to graduate, but I went back and got two certificates and got my GED in prison because I'd made that promise. Yeah. yeah. So. You can't yeah, do it I, without God. No, you know, you can't. And I know there are a lot of people out there might be watching this right now. You might be discouraged. You might feel like you can't keep going. You might have questions. You might have some questions that you've been praying and asking God and you're not getting your answers and you're wondering, is he there? He's there. He's always there. He's always working. Sometimes you just got to. And you know what? When you're in the middle of the storm, he's the closest. Don't ever feel alone because I've been in some situations. Let me tell you, I would put myself in situations after my son got murdered that I thought I couldn't walk out of the middle of drive-bys. I would get myself in situations thinking I was going to get taken out, wanting to get taken out. And somehow he was always the closest to me and I would always walk out of it and I would be mad. Like, God just let me go, mm -hmm. and he would never let me go yeah. until I overdosed at that time. And um, I thought, okay, well, if you won't let me go, then I guess I'm just going to turn to you. There you go. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. If you're not going to let me die, then I'm fine. You Don't know, I'm stomping way. my feet. Okay, fine. It's fine. I'm done. Yeah. I was done. You may, <laughs> you may be at your very, very lowest. But if you're still breathing, he's not done with you. No. So you look up, oh. get up, and come here. We've got to bring him over. Get him on the... Come here, Bubby. This is little miracle guy. Yeah. Hey, say hi. You look at the camera and say hi. Say hi. Who is that? Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, long story short, everybody. Give your life to God. Keep your chin up. Keep going. Don't give up. Never give up. God's always close to you. This lady right here recovers out loud. And she she's not afraid to tell you about Jesus. She's not afraid to tell you about her story. 
he's not afraid to keep it real. If you if you want to hear from her yourself, she's on Could Facebook. Could always hit me up. She's on Facebook. Look her up, Dolly Rusher. She'll be glad to talk to you. Absolutely, absolutely. The hard work in Jesus yep. will get you anywhere. I never in a million years would think that I would be where I'm at. I have a great job that God gave me. You know, I've robbed a judge, and now I'm from home. God gave me that job. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Yes, I'm I've right. got things that there's no explanation but God. God can do it. Absolutely. He oh. is a miracle worker he, and a way maker. God just wants us to follow him. Yeah, don't be like me. Don't take the long way around. Just turn around and give in and give it to him. Yeah. It, it won't be easy, but it'll be no, worth it. It's not easy, but neither is chasing the dope man. Mm -hmm. You know, neither is 3 o'clock in the morning. You're running out of dope and you want to go get a sack and you're hunting down a dope man and calling him. That ain't easy either. You know, neither is shutting yourself in the bathroom doing drugs, locking your kids outside of it yeah. while you got a needle in your arm. That's not easy either. So if you can put in the work to do that, then put in the work to get clean. That's right. All I'm saying is, you know what I'm saying, if you can put in all that work, and I'm telling you what, trying to chase down a dope man is hard work. You don't know. No, I don't. But I'm just saying, those of you out there that are doing that, you know it's hard. So if you can do that, man, put that into getting clean. For real. <laughs> I'm so serious. It's I call Dolly my gangster sister. <laughs> She'll say words, and I'm like, what's that mean? <laughs> but it's, it's not it's not easy. It's not easy. You could get up. Well, you could still be up, not get up, because I would still be up. I didn't go to sleep for weeks, you know. And you could get up and spend your whole day trying to get a bag of dope. All day. All day. Maybe sometimes more than that, depending on, you know, circumstances. If you can do that, then you can put, put an ounce of that energy into getting clean. Don't tell me you can't, dog. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You done made me lose. She done made me lose a lash. This was good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we better wrap it up. Spin right at two hours almost. Oh, wow. Hour and a half. Hour and a half. Wow. So, listen. This is our first ever Unpacked with Overcomer Ministries featuring Dolly Rusher. There we go. Um, if you have a story you want to share, get a hold of me on Facebook. Um, we'll chat and uh, we'll see what we can come up with. If you're getting ready to graduate from a recovery home, Holler at me. Maybe we could get together and get some graduation pictures for you. Um, this is a ministry. Um, I don't get paid to do it. I do it because I want to help celebrate others. I want to encourage others. And I want to give back to Jesus. And and you never know. Your, your story could be somebody else's survival guide. Right. We all need to hear a good uplifting story. Man. We all need to know that somebody out there did it. And so can And I. Jesus is right. Jesus will get you there, man. Yep. He will. Absolutely every time. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, God bless you guys. Have a blessed Have day. Have a great day. And until next time. Deuces.